Now it's right. okay. Great. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to CEPR, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I am Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and the Wayne and Jody Cooperman Professor of Economics here at Stanford. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you to today's event that we are co-hosting with the Stanford King Center on Global Development. I'm really incredibly happy to see so many of you who are able to join us in person today. And I'm really energized that we're kicking off the academic year that just began two days ago uh, with in-person events. I will have to say it's been a long two and a half plus years that we've had to remain mostly virtual. Um, and I'm very grateful to see our community back together again in the same room. And for those of you who are joining us online or who are joining us for the first time, I wanna welcome you to CEPR and invite you to learn more about us. Uh, we've been Stanford's hub for economic policy research since our founding 40 years ago in 1982. And we've grown into a very mission-driven organization that is deeply committed to catalyzing and promoting evidence-based knowledge about today's most pressing economic issues in the US and around the world. Uh, we mentor and support students and the next, gener next generation of economic scholars and policymakers. And we host events like this one to draw a, diver a diverse set of policymakers and business leaders into our orbit. The Stanford King Center on Global Development is one of CEPR's research centers. Their mission is to support path-breaking research on global poverty and development to inspire students through hands-on research opportunities, fellowships and events, and to inform policies and practices by forging strategic partnerships with global policymakers. At the core of both CEPR and the King Center are, are our faculty. Uh, combined, we have well over 100 Stanford faculty who are pursuing research projects related to economic policy here in the US and in many other countries around the world. And these faculty draw from every one of Stanford schools, law, education, engineering, humanities and sciences, medicine, business, and the newly launched Door School of Sustainability. As an academic research institution, all of our scholarship is purely nonpartisan, unbiased, and I'm proud that my colleagues allow the data-driven evidence to drive their scholarship and research conclusions. That said, given our focus on economic policy, we do our best uh, every year to connect with the most influential individuals and organizations in government and in industry. Uh, several of our senior fellows have held positions in Republican and Democratic administrations in Washington, D.C. For example, our Deputy Director, Gopi Shah Goda, just returned uh, earlier this month to Stanford after a year of service as a senior economist on President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. CEPR and Stanford have a very strong pipeline flowing between academia and the policy world, and that helps us attract influential figures in economic policy. And our guest today is an excellent example of that. David Malpass is the 13th president of the World Bank Group, an organization that is committed to ending extreme poverty and building shared prosperity in developing countries. The World Bank has 189 member countries, staff from more than 170 countries, and offices in more than 130 locations. President Malpass started his five-year tenure as head of the World Bank in 2019. Before that, he was serving as Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. He represented the United States in international settings, including the G7 and G20 Deputy Finance Ministerial. He has pushed for sustainable lending practices, more efficient use of capital, and a focus on raising living standards in poor countries. He's also helped create policies uh, intended to reduce the frequency and severity of debt crises. In addition to his public service, David Malpass was previously the founder of a New York-based macroeconomics research firm, and he served as chief economist of Bear Stearns. I could spend lots more time talking about Pro President Malpass's roles and accomplishments in government and in the private sector, but I know we're all eager to hear his presentation and the conversation uh, that follows on the crisis uh, facing economic development. Before I turn things over to him, though, I also want to introduce my friend and CEPR colleague, Catherine Casey. 
Kate is going to be kicking off and moderating our Q&A with President Malpass right after his presentation. Kate is a senior fellow here at CEPR and a faculty affiliate and the current Peros Family Faculty Fellow at the King Center. She's also an associate professor of political economy at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and her research explores the interactions between economic and political forces in developing countries, with a particular interest in the role of information in enhancing political accountability and the influence of foreign aid on economic development. Kate has also worked as a consultant and evaluation specialist for the World Bank, focusing some of her work with them on Sierra Leone. I'm really looking forward to Kate's discussion with President Malpass and to his presentation, as well as hearing your questions in the Q&A after that. So with that, let me welcome everyone again to CEPR and the Stanford King Center, and a special thanks to David Malpass for joining us today. Welcome and take it away. Thank, thank you very much, Mark and, and Kate. I'm going to try to raise this a little bit. I don't know if I can. Oh, there, we'll go that way. Um, and it is, as you said, very good to see people in person. You know, it's, uh, it was a long time when, uh, when uh, we, we couldn't do this, so I'm glad that we can. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Stanford. Uh, thank you to CEPR uh, and the King Center and the Global Development, uh, the King Center for Global D Development for the invitation. As we gather in this prestigious institution, uh, a tough reality confronts the global economy and especially the developing world. A series of harsh events and unprecedented macroeconomic policies are combining to throw development into crisis. This has consequences for all of us due to the uh, in interlinked nature of the global economy and civilizations around the world. The World Bank Group's mission, and thank you, Mark, is to alleviate poverty and boost shared prosperity. We leverage shareholder equity and annual contributions to provide grants and make loans to developing countries to help identify and respond to development challenges. Our financing to developing countries has expanded dramatically in recent years, especially for climate-related finance, which reached $31.7 billion in our fiscal year 2022. Of concern to our mission, our upcoming Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report suggests that the deterioration in development progress began well ahead of the COVID-19 pandemic. The report shows that poverty had been steadily declining through the 1990s and 2000s, progress had slowed by 2015, and extreme poverty rose by roughly 70 million when the pandemic hit. The report also shows a 4% decline in global median income. That's the first decline since our measurements of median income began in 1990. The developing world is facing an extremely challenging near-term outlook shaped by sharply higher food, fertilizer, and energy prices, rising interest rates and credit spreads, currency depreciation, and capital outflows. Under current policies, global energy production may take years to diversify away from Russia, prolonging the stagflation risk that was discussed in the World Bank's Global Economic Prospects Report from June 2022. These shock waves have hit development at a time when many developing countries are also struggling in other areas. Governance, rule of law, debt sustainability, climate adaptation and mitigation, and limited fiscal budgets to counteract the severe reversals in development from the COVID-19 pandemic, including health and education. The human consequence of these overlapping crises is catastrophic. Evidence by the World Bank shows that 70% of children in low and middle income countries are unable to read or understand a basic text by age 10. That's a dramatic deterioration due to COVID-19 related school closures. The recent floods in Pakistan have left over 1,500 people dead. Man-made greenhouse gas emissions are causing climate change, which in turn is having tragic impacts on development in multiple ways. Both adaptation by countries and people harmed by climate change 
and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions are urgently needed. This set of challenges receives the largest share of World Bank Group resources and focus. The World Bank Group has not financed new coal projects since 2010 and has been working actively with developing countries and partners uh, in, in the global community to reverse the trend toward increased use of high carbon emission fuels. Yet, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and limited and high-priced natural gas supplies, coal-fired power plants are seeing their closures postponed across the world and coal mining has accelerated. Facing these overlapping crises, a pressing danger for the developing world is that, the, is that the sharp slowdown in global growth deepens into global recession, as the World Bank discussed in a September report. Global GDP per capita in 2021 barely exceeded its pre-pandemic level, but many developing countries have not reached their pre-pandemic per capita income levels. The U.S. has experienced contractions in GDP in the first two quarters of 2022. The sharp decline in asset prices worldwide has consequences for weakened corporate and pension balance sheets and could dampen new investment. China's economy has slowed sharply due to COVID-19 related lockdowns, pushing the World Bank's 2022 forecast for China down to 2.8% from 5% in April. Europe is confronting the sudden spike in energy prices caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and market rigidities. The weakness of the euro and high inflation increase the likelihood of a European recession and further constrain the eurozone's longer-term growth outlook. <clears throat> Looking beyond this sharp cyclical downturn, developing countries face the risk that these, uh, that these trends in advanced economies, inflation, slow growth, lower productivity, the drain on global energy supplies, and higher interest rates persist beyond 2023. If current fiscal and monetary policies become the new normal, it implies heavy absorption of global capital by advanced governments, prolonging the underinvestment in developing countries and hampering future growth. The macroeconomic challenges facing development are consequential and are probably worsening. I'll return to that in a moment, but I want to take note uh, that there are many other aspects of the development crisis that also require global efforts. These include the devastating flow of arms into Africa, the consequent political fragility, adapting to climate change, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, the violence and deprivation facing women and girls, and the severe reversals in education, health, and debt sustainability that I mentioned earlier. The World Bank Group works extensively in each of these areas, and I'd like to take a moment to highlight this work and thank our World Bank staff. To combat the crises, the World Bank Group responded with unprecedented urgency, scale, and impact. We deployed a record $115 billion in financing in FY22. We've committed consecutive surges of financing, analytical support, and policy advice, first in response to COVID-19 and now to address the food and energy crisis, the war in, in Ukraine and its spillover effects. The war inflicted by Russia has brought loss of lives and destruction. The World Bank has mobilized from bilateral and development partners $13 billion in emergency financing for Ukraine, with about $11 billion already dispersed through our projects and trust funds. To combat climate change, the World Bank Group is by far the largest single funder of climate-related finance in the developing world and a leader on climate diagnostics, methane emission, uh, and uh, innovative methane emission reduction and innovative climate financing. We are also the largest external funder of education in developing countries, much of it through the grants and highly concessional loans offered by IDA, the World Bank's fund for the poorest 75 countries and related trust funds. The health challenge is similarly immense, including the need for a wide range of life-saving vaccinations and preparedness for future health crises. 
With strong U.S. support and leadership, we have just launched a new trust fund that will assess and strengthen health preparedness throughout the developing world. Each of these challenges and crises require urgent global attention and resources. Now I'd like to turn to the remainder of my remarks, which are focused on the macroeconomic challenge, the trade-off between the fiscal and monetary policies in advanced economies, and the challenge this poses for stability and investment in developing countries. CEPR is an important audience for this discussion, and I appreciate your interest. At the core of the macroeconomic crisis facing development is the sea change in fiscal, monetary, and financial regulatory policies of advanced economies since the 2008 financial crisis. Monetary policies over the last decade have been, have been guiding capital to well-capitalized segments of the global economy, to governments, bond-issuing corporations, and wealthy individuals, at the expense of broad-based growth and development. Gross fixed capital formation in developing countries has been stagnant even as asset prices surged in advanced economies. The prospect of a continuation of these policies creates the risk of decades of underinvestment in development. Four points stand out. The extent of the change in macroeconomic policy, the large size of the policies, the impact on the global allocation of capital, and the risk that these policies become permanent, impeding development. <clears throat> Starting in 2008, advanced economies adopted wholly new monetary policies to combat the global financial crisis. Central banks set interest rates to zero or below and bought bonds financed by the, the central bank's accumulation of excess bank reserves. These crisis-focused activities help contain the impact of the financial meltdown. But, as Larry Summers said in 2021, and I quote, the beginning of wisdom is seeing that the quantitative easing prescription makes little sense today. Years of extremely low interest rates and the massive expansion of the monetary base controlled by pervasive regulation of credit amounted to a radically new monetary regime. In effect, monetarism gave way to post-monetarism, in which the specifics of credit regulation and the central bank's choice of bond holdings became more important than the money supply. The monetary base expanded many-fold during the first decade of this new policy without inflationary consequence, because regulatory policy limited the money multiplication that would have occurred under the old system of reserve requirements. This left currencies relatively stable, but inflation vulnerable to supply chains and fiscal policy excess. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the major central banks moved fully into post-monetarism through their large purchases of long maturity bonds. The balance sheet of the Fed ballooned from $4.2 trillion in March 2020 to almost $9 trillion two years later. The Eurozone central banks expanded their balance sheet from 4.7 trillion euros to 8.7 trillion, propelled by the purchase of bonds of Eurozone governments. The Bank of Japan's bond ownership is increasing weekly as it maintains the 0.25% 10-year yield peg during yen weakness and rising global inflation. As a result, the monetary authorities of advanced economies have built their portfolios to over $20 trillion in government bonds, supporting those markets over others. For now, by not renewing bonds that reach maturity, the Fed, the Fed is reducing its balance sheet month by month, this has raised concerns about liquidity in the U.S. bond market, but even at the current pace, it would take more than four years for the central bank balance sheet to return even to its pre-COVID-19 level. Importantly, a new concept of normalization has emerged in which the Fed will seek to maintain bank reserves as a percentage of GDP. Earlier concepts of monetary policy normalization had assumed a runoff of the Fed's bond holdings and a related shrinkage of bank reserves. 
Today's normalization policy and the projections in the Fed's May open market operations report suggest large future net and gross purchases of government bonds by the Fed later this decade. This makes their choice of bonds and of the interest rate on the reserves used to hold the bonds two critical issues for development and the flow of global capital. Of course, fiscal policy has been changing dramatically toward larger national debts in the advanced economies. Both changes are going on simultaneously. This has major impacts on capital markets worldwide as available savings flow into government securities. During the pandemic, governments borrowed heavily from savers around the world, almost always to support consumption more than production. Most of this spending, or reduced taxation, supported advanced economies, often consumption by people with incomes well above the median. Demand grew faster than supply, an imbalance that became more apparent when supply chains began to diversify from China and when the post-COVID-19 recovery and restocking got underway. Relevant to development, the combination of government spending, government debt issuance, and central bank bond buying had the effect of allocating increasing amounts of global capital to a narrow group. The purchase and ownership of bonds by central banks allocates capital from small savers to overcapitalized sectors of advanced economies. The regulation of banks has the explicit bias that debt of advanced economy governments is considered zero risk, while other debt, especially that of small countries, developing countries, or new entrants, is treated as risky and requires bank equity capitalization. The challenge for developing countries is whether global capital will be enough to fund the capital needs of the advanced economy governments and still have enough left over for the investment needs of developing countries. For advanced economies, a key challenge is that fiscal and monetary policy have increasing overlap, raising serious concerns for the independence of monetary policy. One of the largest overlaps is the unprecedented size of the maturity mismatch of the central banks as they fund long maturity asset portfolios with overnight bank reserves and reverse repos. This maturity mismatch affects not only the flow of global capital and financial regulatory policy, it has institutional impacts as well. As the book value of central banks declines, and likely goes negative with the sharp ongoing decline in global government bond prices outside Japan, the central bank's need for absolute political support increases. With few effective statutory or constitutional limits on debt in most advanced economies, this tension can be expected to continue, especially during downturns. <clears throat> Over the years of, mon of post-monetarism, the increase in fiscal and monetary policy accommodation has fed primarily into asset prices in advanced economies. This supports the wealthy who hold these assets rather than the bulk of the population at a moment of nearly unprecedented inequality. Growth in median income has lagged with only a few exceptions. For developing countries, capital inflows mostly supported government spending and asset portfolios, with little showing up in foreign direct investment or gross fixed capital formation. To unwind this imbalance would require clear communication that increased production is a policy goal as is a market-oriented flow of capital to development. With inflation high, several tools are available beyond interest rate hikes. First, create the conditions for supply to increase in response to price increases. Markets are forward-looking, so even the announcement of future supply by private investors and governments would help. Second, in the advanced economies, reduce the size of government current spending and improve efficiency by targeting it more on the poor and vulnerable. This would reduce non-productive demand and leave more space for global capital markets to fund investment, taking pressure off inflation. 
And third, reduce the maturity of the central bank's current and future bond holdings. This would send a signal to markets that capital can flow to other assets, such as the short-term floating rate capital needed by smaller businesses to increase global output. <clears throat> These adjustments of macroeconomic policies would improve the allocation of global capital, providing a path to reduce inflation, increase the value of a broader set of assets, and restart the growth in median income that is key to shared prosperity. The alternative is the status quo, showing, slowing gro global growth, higher interest rates, greater risk aversion, fragility in many developing countries. The crisis facing development is intensifying. Developing countries are in the middle of one of the most in, uh, internationally synchronous episodes of monetary and fiscal policy tightening of the past five decades. More spending on education and health preparedness are urgently needed, and developing country governments will need to spend their limited budget in these sectors more efficiently. The fiscal needs can also be helped with decisive action to broaden the tax base and improve collection efficiency. Debt relief from bilateral and commercial creditors will also play a key role in the most indebted countries. At the same time, the climate crisis caused by greenhouse gas emissions continues to be relentless. Climate-related natural disasters are impacting agriculture production, livelihoods of people across sectors of the economy, and migration. To support climate action, many developing countries need massive investments, concessional finance, and grants to enable their energy, transport, and agriculture transitions. <clears throat> Large sources of funding are also needed to support adaptation and resilience in most developing countries. A principal thrust of the World, our World Bank uh, Climate Change Action Plan is to identify concrete, impactful projects and policies in these areas and build the financing mechanisms and facilities to help the global community support global public goods in developing countries. We're working with public and private partners, shareholders and stakeholders on these challenges in the recognition that much more needs to be done in these areas. Weathering this perfect storm and undoing the recent reversals in development require new macro and microeconomic pathways in both advanced and developing countries. The urgency is clear in daily news reports of inflation, climate change, famine, civil protests, and violence. The World Bank Group is fully engaged in these challenges, realistic in our assessments, and eager to work on solutions, including with all of you participating here today. With that, thank you very much, Kate. I look forward to it. Um, I want to pick up on, uh, you gave us a nice history of, of monetary and fiscal policy in wealthier countries, um, you know, starting in 2008 and how that affects lower income and middle income countries. One of the things that's really changed a lot, and we've seen it all over the news in, in recent weeks, is what you, you referenced, this response to in, inflation by ratcheting up the interest rate. We've all been watching these currency charts as they change and, you know, the dollar is, is strengthening and then other currencies in relation are, are really tanking, you know, including the British pound, but of course, like lots of low income country currencies. And so how do you see this kind of strengthening of, of the dollar and these currency pressures as they're relating to some of these things you've been talking about? So, I mean, it's pretty obvious, like if you're holding dollar denominated debt and your, your own currency taking, that's a problem, it impact on poverty, inequality. So, so how do you see that acceleration and, and what's the way out? Yeah, this, this is a really hard issue because interest rates were so low for so long, and so that attracted people into yielding investments, and then, uh, th then the situation changes rapidly. Right. So for developing countries, they're feeling the inflation. So it, it, there was inflation even in the dollar. So if you right. think about what's happening for countries with weakening currencies, they get extra inflation out of that. It also means that the flow of capital 
stops coming in, and so that's uh, that's adding to the problem. Look, I'm not sure there. You know, we're, the world's at at a at a very difficult moment. That was a, a, the the thrust of my remarks. Um, I think what governments can. I mean. So what, there's two questions. What can the advanced economies do? And I right. went through some of that. Yeah. And then for the for the developing countries themselves, they have to work very fast to in, increase the efficiency of their spending so yeah. that they can show markets that the currency doesn't need to weaken more. Uh, I saw the announcement on the UK today that they're they're working to do that. So mm. they, they want to find a program that will that will give confidence to markets that they can grow into the future. Well, it's very much the same for developing countries. Mm. Like can we <clears throat> yeah, can we focus in on the, the issue of debt in particular? Because um, you've done a lot of work on on sustainable debt and I want to understand more what that means. And I want to I want to read you a quote of your own, <laughs> and then I want to apply it to a specific case study of, of Zambia because I think it's it's quite pertinent. So, um, you you in your remarks to the spring meeting at the World Bank um, said sitting governments are faced with a giant conflict of interest. Borrowing now brings material political benefits, but deprives future governments. This makes the quality and transparency of current spending and investment decisions one of the biggest challenges facing development. So uh, I, I know you met the president of Zambia a week ago, and so you know Zambia is this you know landlocked country. They're very much you know dependent on copper, which you know commodities prices change a lot. And the incoming president got saddled with something like you know 31.7 billion dollars in public debt from the previous regime. Right? And so you, you come in and he's on a reform mission, he's on a clean government mission, a decentralization mission, yet how do you deal with this absolutely staggering debt load? And I, I know Zambia is currently negotiating with the World Bank and has signed some restructuring, but can you help put the debt crisis in perspective? I mean, some of us are old enough to remember like, you know, the big HIPAA initiatives in the, in the 1990s, like even Bono, like the UK, Rockstar was involved with this. So what's the scale of what we're dealing with now how does that compare with what we've seen? And some insights on what's the kind of political economic surrounding debt? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. And if people go back, they can see that uh, decade by decade in history, there are frequently debt crises involving uh, sovereign, sovereign borrowing. Yeah. The temptation, as, as the quote said, is for, for governments to borrow now and, wor and worry about the consequences later. And so right. that, that's a difficulty. I think the the solution or the right approach is to have a lot of transparency. I mean, mm -hmm. a starting point for understanding how much uh, or what the consequence of your debt is to allow disclosure of what the interest rate is, what's the term, what what uh, side agreements were done in terms of is there collateral for the debt. Mm -hmm. So that's a main thrust that uh, that I've had and that we have in trying to get a better uh, environment going forward. The situation that we're in right now is there were multiple factors over the last uh, 15 years inviting over indebtedness. So some of the some of some, so quite a number of the uh, poorer countries or we weaker countries have uh, uh, unsustainable levels of debt. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things the world is trying to do is find a process to help them unwind, and that applies to Zambia. So I guess what, one thing for background for people to think about is uh, the, in, in beginning in 2010 or so, the composition of the debt of the poor countries began changing dramatically. One was the, uh, the advent of China lending heavily into mm -hmm. the developing world. So if we compare the debt profile of countries today to what it was 20 years ago, it's dramatically different. 20 years ago, you would have seen a a country that had debt trouble that would have owed a lot of that money to the United States, to, uh, to European countries, to Japan, uh, and maybe a little bit to China or to India, to others. Uh, and then fast forward, now if we look at the debt profile, of, uh, and Zambia is not atypical, uh, that, that there's very little owed to the U.S. to to France to uh, uh, the 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 European countries, uh, but substantial amounts to the private sector in the form of bonds. So that's a new 
a, a, a relatively new occurrence with, for developing countries, and then also to China. So that means you need some kind of changed system in order to begin to deal with it. One added challenge in this, unlike in corporate, uh, in, in corporate debt restructurings, which are the stuff of MBA classes, and maybe, maybe students here are doing some of that, there, there is not, no bankruptcy process mm. for government. So you, you know if, in, if you overborrow, if a corporation overborrows or an individual overborrows, in many countries around the world, there's some process where you can request relief from your creditors. They may take all your assets, but at least you can find a way through the process and mm. then regain your status. There's not, there's not the equivalent for sovereigns, so we need to find better other ways. That means tra in, enhanced transparency, and we're working to try to, uh, one of the things I'm pushing for and working for is to try to more quickly resolve the debt, so Zambia uh, uh, declared in, in uh, late in 2020 or early 2021, mm -hmm. the debt is just too much, we can't pay it. Uh, and so they, they stopped paying at that point and asked the international community for help. It's been very slow in coming. I've complained some in public about the debt process being stalled. Right. And so what we're trying to do is uh, push it forward uh, for Zambia, but also then it can be applicable to the m several of the other countries that are facing uh, unsustainable debt. That means debt where reasonable people looking at the forecast for the country and the terms of the debt realize that the people of the country simply aren't going to be able to shoulder that burden. So right. that's unsustainable. And so you need to start a process to work it out. So we're encouraging governments to w move more quickly to that if that's the case, right. uh, but then also trying to have a situation where we don't keep repeating the same mistake in the, in the future. We're working with China on ways for their, as they lend into developing countries, for it to be more transparent. So the terms are there, the contract is maybe public, which has uh, not been their, their uh, practice, right. and that way people can examine the debt, see whether there's better ways to be doing it. Yeah, great. I want to pick up because you, you, you mentioned the role of China, and China has, has invested a lot in Zambia, not just in the last 20 years. Since the 1970s, they've built a lot of infrastructure. They've had a lot of diplomatic ties. I, I personally am interested in this because just the volume of development financing, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, China just really has just increased their amount and you know, spends much more than like, you know, the U.S. and the U.K. and you know, on, a, on a bilateral basis. But there, people seem to have these kind of straw man views of this. So uh, on the one hand, offering debts with fewer strings attached, fewer conditionalities is a very empowering position for domestic governments, right? They have an outside option, whereas you know, World Bank and IMF and you know, some of the Paris club lenders tend to have you know, much more conditionalities put on there, so it's kind of empowering for them. But then you know, the critics are saying, but without you know, conditionalities, there's no transparency and accountability, and you, know, you can open up space for bad governance and corruption, human rights, and stuff like that. So I, I want to ask you more a question about the World Bank strategy with respect to having you know, a giant lender that's lending on different terms, different speeds, different sectors. They're very much into infrastructure. Has that changed what the World Bank's approach has been, both recently and also the president of China has, has announced he's cutting back their development lending by, by a third. So that's a huge reduction of money flowing into the continent at a time where you've articulated they're under so much pressure and they're also pivoting away from infrastructure more into like private sector SME investments. So what was the World Bank's response to the rise of China and then this, this tapering off now? The, I, one overarching thing I think we ought to talk about is the need for more resources into developing countries. Sure. And so if China, as China was putting more resources in, many of the developing countries embraced that. Um, but then back to this challenge of if you're a political figure in the countries, that may benefit you more than, uh, than others. Politically, it's, a, it's beneficial to be the one that brings home the, the deal. So... Um, I, I, there, it's very hard, I think, for, for, to find a balance uh, between what's best for the people of the country and what the various people signing the contracts are, are thinking about as they do it. 
And mm -hmm. I, so my view is the only way through that is through transparency. If everyone sees what the, what the, your government is signing, then that's going to end up with a with a more fair deal uh, that's going on. So we're pushing for that, and but but also recognizing that China's provided net flows to the country. So yeah. uh, so part of this is uh, trying to work with them to make progress on some of the some of the investments that weren't such good ones right. you know some of the investments were good ones we embraced that that the countries embraced that and right. then try to have a process to work through for them to work through and work out uh, uh, investments uh, either in projects or in sovereign uh, you know, sovereign loans that that uh, that went astray that didn't work um, uh, and you know, China changes and evolves uh, just li like other countries do. And my perception is they're, they hear this in the international community. They're looking for ways uh, to find this forward. And I also emphasize to them and to uh, anyone who will uh, hear me <laughs> that, it, that there, there is a strong self-interest for China to find ways through this as well, because they're the world's second biggest economy. So what could be better for China than to have developing countries growing fast? That's markets for China. Right. So there's, I think, more commonality than people realize in this situation. Yeah, great. I want to ask you one more question, but then I'm going to take it to the floor. So, so think about what you want to ask, David. Um, you came under a lot of uh, very public criticism yeah. last week about your personal stance on climate change. So I, I know you've been on CNN, but not everybody in the room watches CNN. So I wanted to first just give you an opportunity to clarify your position if you're interested in doing that. Sure, or I'll state my position. Yeah. Yep. And so there was an event on Tuesday in New York where the it was supposed to be on the impact of uh, World Bank on climate, which I, I was really eager to talk about. And the first question was, yeah, you know, you're a climate denier. And, and so I'm not a climate denier. It's clear greenhouse gas uh, emissions cause global warming. Uh, the, the, the words didn't come out right as, uh, as we went forward in that. So I, you know, have stated and restated my position and also the World Bank's uh, efforts. So the real emphasis I want to put and not, dis you know, not have a distraction from all the work that the World Bank is doing. As I said in my remarks, you know, the World Bank is this, by far the biggest international funder of climate uh, uh, spending in the developing world. Uh, and and that, so we have giant teams of people working on, on countries around the world to find ways to adapt to climate change, uh, which is actually a really difficult task. Mm -hmm. How do you move people away from floodplains? How do you uh, uh, create resilience within their infrastructure for, for uh, climate change? Uh, and then we also are wor working hard to have uh, pro programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the large emitters within the developing world. Mm -hmm. So that's a major thrust of the World Bank. We're a world leader in uh, articulating that and in trying to help the world find a way, way different ways for the global community to fi finance global public goods. I, yeah. you know, I mentioned that in my remarks, and the reason that's important, I mean, that's actually a hard economic problem, mm -hmm. you, and people write whole textbooks about how do you get, how do you have people who don't personally benefit from something get, or, or who, where the benefits are so diffuse that yeah. there's not an individual self-interest in doing it. So global right. public goods in the climate space are an intense problem that the, the, the poor countries say, look, we didn't create the problem, uh, and it's very expensive to, uh, to reduce our coal-fired power plants. How are you going to help us do that? Yep. And so the World Bank's in the middle of that. W one thing we can bring to the table that's really important is a long relationship with the government of a country. So uh, in a lot of cases, what you need mm -hmm. is the country to have a plan for what it's going to do and then to stick with that plan over a long period of years. But in order to do that, there has to be financing coming in to help pay for the transition, the transition fuels, the, the uh, transition for the people in their 
in their uh, in their work. Right. Um, you know, I, India faces a specific problem. For example, that they're, they're, the, w w one of the biggest employers is the coal is the coal industry, both the mining of coal, the transport of coal through the railway system, and then the burning of coal. <laughs> but they have a very clear problem of air pollution, but then also of uh, uh, high emitting carbon dioxide uh, activity. And so a challenge is how do you, how do you uh, help the country move to, uh, to, to new, a new, new uh, type of economy and type of labor, type of uh, uh, relationship with the rest of the world. So w we're engaged in that country by country uh, around the world. Very important part of what the World Bank does. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I like your phrase. I mean, it's a truly you know, like uniquely global public good, and the World Bank is well placed to facilitate some of that. You know, what are the actions of low-income countries, and what is the support coming from wealthy countries in terms of paying for those actions and the distribution of? You, you yeah. know, one that people don't want to talk about it very much, but the current environment is one where there's backsliding. So the the reopening of coal-fired uh, power plants is going on, uh, and. It, it, including and especially in the advanced economies, and then more coal mining uh, going on. So that also is one of the things uh, to try to try to offset and stop as it's going on. We work with countries on permitting. One of the one of the challenges is countries are issuing lots of new permits mm. for coal-fired power plants. So that's one of the one of the uh, key challenges that we're working on. Yeah, excellent. Okay, I want to make space for questions from the audience. So what I'm going to ask you is just when you start talking, just first like five seconds, state your name and, and your connection to Stanford, to Seaford, to the King Center, whichever. Yeah, start here. I'm gonna, and I'm going to collect three, let David respond, and then I'll collect uh, three more. Can you show me where? Okay, this gentleman in the front. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you for an amazing uh, interview. Um, this is uh, a terrific. My name is uh, John Hartley. I'm a econ PhD student here at uh, the economics department uh, next door. Um, I have two super quick questions. Um, one, uh, on China, should China still be a World Bank aid recipient country, given that you know, GDP per capita is uh, much wealthier, or they're on average a wealthier country than other aid recipients, and they're also able to invest in the rest of the world? And two, I'm curious how the doing business index revamp is going. I know. There's a lot of, I think, excitement around this uh, new um, BE index. I, I think that's um, coming out. Obviously, institutions are important for growth, and it's really one of the best ways that we can measure institutions. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, in the front here. Oh. oh, that's okay. There's one here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pre uh, President Malpass. Um, my name is Leal. I'm originally from Bahrain. I'm a second year student doing my undergraduate studies here. Um, so I had two questions. Um, one is, given the recent events in Iran, where does the World Bank find its position within that? Um, and how does that manifest as? Um, and my second, very different, um, kind of on the same note though, given the current events in Sri Lanka, how is the World Bank working to support the Sri Lankan people? Um, and how, does the World Bank in these scenarios um, deal with governments that may be difficult to reach or governments unwilling to receive the aid? Okay, I'm gonna pause. That was actually four questions. <laughs> <laughs> Two people. Sorry. So, but just to reiterate, we've got, should China still be a World yeah, Bank recipient? I got them. Doing I got this, you got yeah. All right, take it away. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we do lend to China uh, under the capital increase of the World Bank that occurred in 2018. There was an agreement or a, you know, a discussion among shareholders what to do about this because China, China's income has come up so fast. Uh, what, what are the boundaries on that? And so the, the agreement was to reduce the lending year by year in which we are doing. So we'll fall under a billion dollars a year, meaning it's not, it's not a large program for the, for the, world, uh, for the world Bank. Uh, China is no longer a large program for the World Bank. One thing people should know is China's a n net payer to the World Bank because they're paying 
on previous loans that were made to China. Now, and final point I'll make on China is they want, they're very uh, uh, desirous of having the lending from the World Bank, not because it's the lowest, not because of the cost, it's actually not their lowest cost, uh, we're not their lowest cost lender. They can uh, access money in, in global markets, but it's because they want the, uh, the, and they're nice about this, the advice. One story, they, they used to have, so the World Bank helped them uh, substantially in river cleanup. Uh, and uh, so I've been with President Xi, with uh, Premier Li, where they mentioned that. They know what World Bank pro project occurred, uh, uh, you know, the projects over the years. So they say, Please continue, Can, and so we're, we're down to many fewer loans being made. It's a good relationship, uh, and they're also a major contributor to IDO. Uh, so, you know, the good, so we're, we're evolving the relationship, and I, I think we're, we're comfortable with that. Um, the doing business report is, was, is really important. Um, the World Bank is very involved in trying to encourage private sector development in countries. One way that was done with that report called the doing business report was to rank countries, it, uh, meaning you, one country number one and country number two. I see sometimes on the internet, you can say, what are the best places to live, countries to live? You can imagine the, the uh, difficulty in creating such an index. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody argues about what do you put into the index. So that occurred on doing business, and there were data irregularities, and we discontinued it. We're replacing it with uh, a, a report that has yet to, so our board will be discussing it in October. There's uh, still issues to define as far as how to do it, but the bigger picture is World Bank working through all of our different arms, the International Finance Corporation, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MIGA, uh, the, the IDA and IBRD, all parts of the bank to encourage specific changes in countries that enable private sector activity. So we'll be doing new reports on that, uh, and that's a mainstay diagnostic within the World Bank. Um, the the uh, Iran issue uh, is is difficult uh, to, uh, because the World Bank doesn't uh, lend to Iran except in the COVID crisis there was there were specific requests from the international community and the World Bank did lend through uh, 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 WHO in Iran uh, for COVID direct COVID uh, related support. It didn't go to the government of, uh, of Iran. It went directly to people in the form of, uh, of uh, personal protective equipment and, uh, uh, and maybe vaccines. I'm a little, I'm not clear on that. World Bank is, it was a big funder of vaccine, COVID vaccines. We did uh, as much as $10 billion in as many as 60 countries uh, to make financing available. So it was one of the major parts of the global effort to make available uh, 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 vac vaccines. And we're still doing that part of the program. And to the bigger picture, we listen to our shareholders as far as what the relationship is with countries like Iran. And you you said, how do you deal with hard to connect with countries like maybe Sri Lanka? Um, so uh, the bank has 189 members. I know that because I heard that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and um, we actually have pretty good relations with lot. I, I meet with lots of government officials in New York last week amid the the uh, uh, the, uh, the my my mis the misinterpretations on Tuesday. Uh, I met with twenty. Uh, more than 20 uh, world world leaders. I walked 15,000 steps on Wednesday last week uh, <laughs> because it's hard to get around in New York during the uh, d during the UN General Assembly, uh, and we had a bunch of meetings on other topics like food security, fertilizer, on education, on digitalization, major uh, conferences where the World Bank is co-host. I I went into that because. Um, we try to find, so there are countries who say, we don't want the advice of the world, we just want to do what we're doing. Uh, and uh, so we, we actually try to reach out to those countries and form a relationship and work them in a, in a better direction. With regard to Sri Lanka, um, 
they are, uh, uh, had borrowed heavily. Um, so I, I'm, and World Bank is not so directly involved in that. They're not one of the low income countries that we would work on a joint basis with the IMF on. Mm. Uh, so the IMF is engaged in Sri Lanka and also the bilateral lenders. So Japan, uh, uh, China, and India are all working with the government of Sri Lanka, which I think is, is, is good. And it's important that they move as quickly as countries hit really a deep crisis as Sri Lanka did. The most important thing is for them to have a plan and to execute it quickly because the, the risk and the cost is doing things slowly in, in the midst of a crisis. Yeah. Uh, that was it. You got it. Okay. I want to hear from some more students, but only one question per person, right. okay? <laughs> yes. You can just say it really loudly. I think you'll be okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Sophie Ru. I'm a... Thank you so much. Hi. I'm, I'm Sophie Ru. I'm a first-year student. Um, I'm planning to major in civil engineering and architecture with a focus on sustainable energy systems and girls' education infrastructure. Um, and I was wondering, uh, in your opinion um, and uh, the World Bank's uh, perspective, as we move away uh, post-COVID from uh, like coal energy into other forms of energy, what do you see as the most realistic and equitable form of energy? And how does loaning and microfinancing um, locally in uh, countries around the world making this transition um, work? Great. Thank you. Other hands? Yep. There. Just be loud. Yeah. Project. Okay. We're live streaming. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, YouTube. Um, hi, uh, my name is Peter. I'm a PhD student in biochemistry. Um, and um, you spoke um, about monetary policy, but not as much about changes in trade policy. And how do you see the shift away from um, like large global trade towards onshoring, um, towards protectionism, um, and away from like in changing uh, uh, supply chains, impacting uh, global development? Okay, somebody over here, Pascaline. Okay, here you go, Pascaline. Thanks, I'm Pascaline Dupin. I'm a professor of economics and also the faculty director of the King Center here. Um, we are a research in university, so as you know, our role is to advance knowledge and diffuse it and to help identify solutions to pressing problems through scientific research and innovation. Um, and obviously, we teach students. But um, you know, of, uh, often we realize that all the stuff we do, all we produce, the knowledge, the skills, uh, is not useful if it's not put to good use. And it's very heartbreaking for our students and ourselves, faculty, to see how often the decisions that really matter for the lives of poor people or that matter for sustainability are made by politicians or political appointees. So what is the message that you want to give us as uh, you know, our young students here and our faculty? Uh, what hope can we have that um, you know, contributing to knowledge and science going forward is going to make a difference? Um, how can we make sure that uh, evidence-based uh, policymaking uh, only rises uh, going forward? Thanks. Yeah, those are great, great yeah. questions. All I, I wanted to um, so the 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 first one on uh, uh, on how the, what, what can be the energy future. Um, it's clear that there will be multiple sources, and it's going to vary around the world. Europe is going through this uh, uh, process of thinking about what their energy structure of the future is going to be. Clearly, renewables will be a big part of it. But right now, the technology advances are needed in terms of battery storage and in terms of making more efficient the, the, uh, uh, the renewables that are there. I, hydro for some countries will be important. The uh, geothermal will be important. Uh, and so these are all engineering challenges that are important. I think uh, you know, there's exploration of, these, of nuclear and the, the uh, 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 I forget what they're called. Small nuclear uh, it, it may have advances, and the the uh, electricity needs are huge. So one of the this has to be discussed in the context of there being 800 million people in the world that don't have electricity, um, and there's this almost perfect overlap between the people that don't have electricity and the people in extreme poverty. Uh, it's happening in the same parts of the world. So one of the goals as the World Bank tries to alleviate uh, extreme poverty is to have electric uh, electricity available, access. That's also SDG 7, Sustainable Development Goal, uh, uh, high priority for the U United Nations and the global community. So 
Um, I wanted, I mean, this is a really important problem of how does decentralized, in, so in rural areas, the solar, uh, so solar opportunities are working and we're very engaged in trying to have uh, uh, scalable uh, solar energy that can be done in rural areas. So that's one point and that work is going on and uh, is right now, one of the limitations on that is the availability of solar panels themselves. Mm. And same with wind energy and the availability of the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, big installations that make wind turbines. Um, but uh, I wanted to make one other point because you mentioned engineering too. Um, a challenge for urban areas worldwide, whether in Poland or in, in, in uh, Lusaka, is uh, the grid itself. So most people that are having electricity get it off the grid, as we do here. And that, that creates these big engineering challenges because uh, many parts of the world have reached saturation in terms of the renewables feeding into the grids. And mm -hmm. so there needs to be lots more engineering on that and also the transmission of electricity. So I, th I think, you know, for engineers, there will be lots of work in improving the existing systems so that they're more efficient uh, uh, and therefore less, uh, less taxing on the on the. Uh, on the environment. And I didn't want to pick up, sorry, on the girls' education, you know, uh, what? Uh, th this is vital for development to have more girls in school and stay in school. And important in that is that there be running water and there be electricity in the school. So one of the advances being needed is to have structures of education in developing countries that work for girls, uh, because it's notable as we come out of COVID, uh, the schools were shut down, the government stopped funding education, then if they do open, it's the boys that are going back to school and the girls are l getting left out. Um, trade policy is critical. I, so I have, uh, I've been, I started in trade in Washington in uh, 1983 and 84. Uh, so I have views, which is that globalization, meaning efficient trade, is really powerful. Having you know, the, the concept of people trading village to village, neighbor to neighbor, and then across border is economics is really clear that this works. It makes people more efficient because they specialize. So we can't lose that. So then the, my, my view is we, the world got over dependent on supply chains from China uh, for, for everything and from Russia for energy, and now is trying to work toward more diversified supply chains which is we should view as a positive big challenge to bring in new developing countries so they can have a portion of the market for it. And so my speech today wasn't on that, but I give lots of remarks on that point. What I just met last week, we, we, ha we have an important forum of five uh, international organizations on the food, energy, and fertilizer crisis, which is an interlinked crisis. So I've, uh, Kristalina of the IMF and Gosi of WTO, the David Beasley of the WFP, and then the head of FAO, we, uh, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, met in New York last week, and we issued a kind of a joint statement, which was a, a lot on trade and had the specific points that countries can't put trade export restrictions on what they're doing, that's one thing, and then should not be blocking imports. So it was kind of a full-throated support for trade liberalization. We do it in the World Bank, we talk, call it trade facilitation. I, uh, IFC, I've in, uh, I, I have launched, and IFC has really expanded its role in trade uh, finance, mm -hmm. which is one of the hard, problems for, uh, for poorer countries because the banks have cut many countries off. So the normal process or the old process of letters of credit had, had really be, uh, stopped operating. So IFC has stepped in and is doing that in countries like Ukraine and in countries in Africa. Um, and then um, uh, the, the uh, professor's uh, comment. So I, I'll just say in general for people, um, 
recognize that individuals matter in the global system. So it's true that politicians are making lots of decisions, but my observation is that individuals who aren't in the system also are making lots of decisions. That might be innovation, that might be a nonprofit, that might be a corporation where you invent something and make lots of money and, and employ lots of people. So I hope everybody will just fan out over the world and uh, do the best you can in the, with the skills that you have and then recognize the world wants everything you've got. So that, that'd be my thought. Don't get put down, don't get uh, negative on the global system. Just try to make it work better. All right, <laughs> great. I think we'll end there. I'd love to thank David. Please everybody join me. Thanks Deeper. Thanks King Center. Thanks to our moderator, Kate Casey, and I hope to see uh, many of you back here uh, in the weeks ahead. And just, uh, I guess, uh, on October 11th, we're going to have an event also looking at the developing world, looking at the, develop the economic development and the political situation in Iraq since the fall of Saddam in 2003. So I think that's going to be a pretty interesting event. A couple weeks after that, we'll have a half-day event on tax policy. Uh, which I also think will be uh, terrific. And we've got lots more coming down the pike. So please visit seeper.stanford.edu to stay up with what we're doing. Uh, look at our events and feel free to reach out. And we really hope to see you more. And thank you so much for uh, coming uh, today. See you soon.